Hello, everyone. Yeah. Welcome to another Ask the Trainer live stream. Uh, my name is Jonas, and with me is Mr. Noseman. And today we are here to answer a few questions from you, from our lovely audience. So uh, before we do that, let me jump into this, the housekeeping. So um, we also have Kyle in the background. Uh, thank you, Kyle. Kyle is going to paste uh, one or the other link here. So I'm going to start with this one. So this is our thanks for joining our live stream uh, site. And from here, you can go to all these other tabs that I have open, the Maxon event site, the free t-shirt site, the Maxon training team YouTube channel um, that is hosting all the recordings, Cineversity for learning, well, for tutorials about all of our softwares. And here is this uh, little section where you can ask your question um, even in advance that gives us the time to maybe prepare um, some stuff every once in a while. And we're also going to um, reply to questions that you are um, uh, typing into the chat. And yeah, with that being said, it would be cool if you could add a capitalized question in the beginning of your question that makes it easier for us to um, filter those from the other comments. All right. So yeah, let's go through these links then in the end. For now, I'm just going to show this one. There's also a QR code. We have a QR code for that. Um, let me quickly bring that up. So you can, you can enter this side using this QR code here as well. I'm going to leave that for a second. And I'm also going to show it later again. So I think that was enough time, was it? Noseman, would you have taken um, the the QR code already to open up a browser in your smartphone? I don't know. I generally avoid shooting uh, QR codes using my smartphone. As... But in this case, you would, right? I generally avoid. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Yeah, Very good I, one. <laughs> okay, note to myself. Everyone else should ask. do it. Wait, wait. <laughs> Trust us, we know what we're doing. Ev I everyone else should do it. Um, no one would just not do it because he knows uh, the site and all the other links that are attached to that. Okay. So and, and I'm a conspiracy theorist, so I'm very suspicious of everyone, including my mother. So <laughs> let me take it. That's good. <laughs> so let's maybe start with one of those questions that have been added uh, through this site here. And I'm going to jump into Cinema 4D and you see this awesome uh, landscape. I just mentioned that this gives us time to prepare stuff. Um, so here we go. Um, the question was, and this is a very interesting one, is it possible to dynamically add a higher mesh density by fields or similar, for example, to the terrain object. That's why I chose um, the terrain or landscape object. Okay, and I'm gonna show you how you can do that. So, you know, there is a subdivision uh, command here under add subdivide, right? So as soon as this would be a polygon object, let's, let me just make this a polygon object by just selecting it and making it editable. Now you can see that we can subdivide this, including um, smooth subdivision and so on. So how can we apply this dynamically? Well, there is a way. When you open up the asset browser and um, search for subdivide, you will also find this command as a node operator. And yeah, don't shy away because it's called node operators. Because the cool thing about these operators inside of Cinema 4D in the asset browser is that we can add them to the object manager. And these are not the only ones that we have there. If I don't search for it, but instead go to operators, then you can see the geometry modifiers. Let me switch to list few here. And you can see there is a whole bunch of these. And um, yeah, we can add them as children to our uh, objects that we want to uh, modify. In this case, subdivide. 
So let me drag and drop this over and put it as a child of this landscape. And suddenly you can see, okay, we have this. Um, so when we deactivate it, it's not being subdivided. If we do so, then it is being subdivided. And now we can set this up a little more. Like, let's say we want to add another subdivision. Maybe we should do smooth first because actually the iter uh, iterations are two different parameters um, depending on if this is on or not. But now we have this and we want to switch between these two states, not only by um, doing this for the whole object, but also for parts of the object. That was actually the question. So the easiest one is to just go to polygon mode and um, make a selection here. And then when I activate this one again, you can see that we already have only these selected polygons subdivided. Why is that? Because here in the subdivide, we have this selection string uh, input field. And um, there is a default selection string in here, and that is called default. And what default does is whenever there is a selection um, active in polygon mode or in any other component mode, it will use that. If there is no selection, it will use or will apply the effect to all the polygons or the whole object, right? So here we can also just type in numbers. Now you can see this is polygon one. We can also type in um, stuff like this. And then we have these polygons here, or we can use polygon selections. And this is where we can create the link between fields and the landscape. Uh, and the subdivide. So what I would do here is I would right click the landscape object and I would go to other tags, polygon selection. And inside the polygon selection tag, we use fields. And we don't need the freeze layer. The freeze layer is um, saving the original or the, the selection that has been active when you created um, this object or this, um, well, when you activated fields. Uh, so we're going to delete that. Instead, we're going to use, let's say, a spherical field. I just love the spherical field um, and move it up so that we have it up here. And now this is driving this selection. Right now, we cannot see that. So it's not using this selection. And this is because we need to add the selection here to this selection string. So instead of of using uh, 1 to 20, we're going to delete that. And we're just going to drag and drop this polygon selection over. Um, notice that it is in quotes. The name is in quotes. That's important when you want to add um, um, selections here. And now I can move around the sphere or the spherical field. And you can see that um, it is dynamic. Right. So in case you, you need some sort of effect, like rendering only the lines and you need some, uh, some movement in there, you can uh, achieve it um, using this technique. All right. So this is the first one that I wanted to show. Do you want to take the next or... Do you want me to show another one, Noseman? Anything. Um, let's uh, quickly go through a few which are just replies. So, Hello Studio, tentacle dynamic animation. I read it in your, the question you sent at some points. The, the short answer is this is not sort of one technique we can apply. It all depends on how you want to control it, what happens before the animation, this particular part, what happens after. You know, if it's a fully rigged, if it's just a tentacle in a hole, you can use rope simulations and uh, you can pin the uh, animation of one side and uh, animate it, which is the, the free part of the tentacle. The one that's stuck, you just leave it on a point, um, stuck to a connector maybe. But if you want to use joints to animate the tentacle to go inside the hole to get stuck and have simulation on top of that, then it becomes a totally different story. So uh, I couldn't provide you with a single answer because there could be many different ways to do it, depending on how you want to control it. 
um, in these cases, some sort of reference you've seen, um, some uh, clip or something like that um, would, would be very helpful. But this will, could take you know, over an hour on itself to analyze all the potential uh, answers. So yeah, um, I apologize, but th these very complex things, it's very hard to you know, fit them in a segment. Well, maybe what, what you can do, what you could do um, is um, be more specific in the question um, about the use case that you have, and then um, we may be able to, to show a technique there. Yeah, yeah, break. You know, uh, if it's something, for example, I have a tentacle that has been created using joints, and I want this to be the outcome. Um, you can send us a simple file with that. We can take a look, show us a reference of what you would like it to do. And if it's something we can fit in a five, 10 minute segment, then uh, we can we can do it. But here, there's too much guessing about this. Again, yeah. use a rope an animated uh, spline with a rope, uh, use a sweep to create your tentacle, but I'm pretty sure that's not what you would like to do. Uh, yeah, so if yeah, you want to send talk. files, I just, yes. um, um, I'm showing our social handles. So uh, let's get in touch and then uh, you can send something. Yeah, a couple of questions from uh, David. Um, when converting materials from older projects into redshift materials, the a built-in conversion tool is uh, usually doesn't work. Is it my setup? Well, we don't know your setup. Um, this is something that will translate some of the common parameters. We don't know how the material was built, and we don't know what the compatibility. If you use the Loomis shader, for example, in your standard material, for example, that can't be translated to Redshift. And as far as your second question, um, you're converting all your materials from shader graph to node-based. Um, I mean, there's no, uh, I don't think there's ever going to be any compatibility issue uh, if you, if it's more convenient to you to convert them. But as long as they work, uh, I would think that you shouldn't have to do it unless you want to take advantage of some of the things or just do things in the new nodes uh, interface. There is no... You know, what is, do we have any advantages of the new node system that, I mean, build the yeah. new materials, build the well, new it's, it's Yeah, it's also um, about the, the nodes that are being used with the old materials. It might be um, the the material node um, rather than the standard um, uh, surface node. Um, and the standard surface is coming with um, better and faster um, yeah, rendering, better in terms of better energy conservation. And um, there are a few things that are really looking better. Um, yeah. So rather than just converting them uh, from shader graph materials into um, node materials, let me just show you that. If I um, open up a material here in the node editor, um, standard now is the RS standard. Um, with your old, um, with your old materials, it's possible um that this is going to be the node um that is piped into the output um it has many of these functionalities of the standard but behind the scenes it's working uh, differently and the rs standard one is the one that we recommend um there's also another advantage with the rs standard and that is that is uh, uh supported uh, in the viewport Yep. Okay, then let me jump yes, to... Uh, all right, yes. I have an idea. Since um, I saw an answer from Halal Studio, love this technique, then I think it's a good opportunity to very quickly show people what I meant when I said use a, a spline, okay? So here's yes. my, my scene. So I'm just going to recreate this. Uh, I'm going to do a straight line. My The fastest thing is to use the end side. There is a capsule for that, but can't be bothered. If you take an end side, make it two and make it editable, you have a straight line. Uh, US, 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 US to subdivide it. Then let's make two cubes. Uh, and I'm going to make them fairly small, 10 centimeters, put it here at minus 200. Make another one, put it on the other side. Oops. 
let's go back here I'll put it on plus 200 and I'm going to explain how I'm going to use them I'm going to call this right I'm going to call this left so I'm going to make both these in the simulation uh, cloth bodies the reason is I'm going to make this a rope and I'm going to also add a connector connector now if I press play everything is going to fall right and if I do this you'll see the spline falling as well what I want to do is tie the ends of the spline to the right and, and left and at the same time I want these to stand still the way to do that is to go to your cloth and say mix animation pins that's it so if you pin the animation without any vertex maps they will become um, static objects essentially and now I'm going to go to the connector and I'm going to say well let's uh, create update live and find a way to connect to the objects next to it there you go we just make this big enough so it ties to some of the points and it doesn't matter how many points we have there now if I press play you will see that we have these two attached points here and now what we can do is first of all uh, we're in water so gravity doesn't exist or there's negative gravity so sort of positive gravity which is buoyancy but in any case what i can do now is when i press play this now is a tentacle of sorts and uh, finally uh, let's create a tentacle using a cylinder and i'm going to remove the capsule use a capsule anyway whatever object and uh, let's uh, make sure we have enough subdivisions with this object so i'm going to go and make more subdivisions make it nice and thin if you're asking me why not use a sweep object on this spline is because the sweep object has a tendency when you export it as an alembic for example or when you want to render it using motion blur sometimes there's um, points that move around and you won't have a stable one whereas if you use my famous now which is I think me and no one else the spline wrap technique on the cylinder and I want to make sure that it's on the plus y the arrow points in the direction I want to um, deform this put the spline in here and now this should follow Ooh, it's not following why ain't it following okay that's what happened to my spline oh yeah I don't have any gravity nothing broke it's just me there you go so you have your little tentacle and the good thing about the spline wrap is just like this the sweep it has the size thingies here where you can make it thinner thicker and do all those nice thingy doodles so let's extend this and then you can go and clone on the surface some um, what are those called that the octopi have and there you go you have your tentacle get me out of here get me out of here ah oh, sorry i get carried away i just have too much fun doing these things and uh, yeah when i'm uh, offline i'm gonna save it and uh, hit me up uh, hello studio on uh, twitter please and i can send you a link using dropbox so you have this set up here or anyone else for that matter just dm me if it's spam i just don't open it and uh yeah at noseman gr so what else do we have oh right i want to get the other one with the point cache uh, are we okay with that Janos? sure so we have an interesting question here that says boo, 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 boo. where am i where was that where was that where was that oh Oh, come Can on. you share a practical example of how the point cache deformer works? That was the question from Zach. Exactly. Okay. Quickly so, put it on screen. Put it on screen while this guy is using uh, the point cache deformer to sort of jog, right? You can play some music here. Right. So I have a linear field here, which is controlling which part of this object receives. <laughs> this is so funny. This is too That's funny. really funny. Yeah. <laughs> this okay. is why we love this job, folks. Yeah. And this is why you all should love your job in three years. We're supposed to be working hard, crying out loud. Don't say that publicly. Well, no, we Jonas, meant, Jonas meant that. Jonas meant that. having fun work. working hard. 
we don't have so much fun, to be honest. So um, let's start with um, this Alembic file. This is just the puppet, and I just exported an Alembic file in loop. So when you take an Alembic file, first of all, if you want to cache it, because in order to use the point cache deformer, you need a point cache. This is similar to using the, what is it? The morph deformer, where you need a morph tag. Now, the reason why a point cache and a morph deformer exist is that tags themselves cannot have fields unless it's the, the selection tags and the vertex maps and the vertex colors. Um, they, it, it's something about the, the, the way the subsystem works. So we need to take that data and put it in a deformer. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, if you have an Alembic that's reading from the disk and you want to point cache it, if you go right click and you go to rigging and you bring up the point cache, you can store the state, but it doesn't allow you to calculate. So there's something odd going on, store state, calculate. What you need to do with the Alembic is first of all, make it editable. And what happens is it generates the original topology of the first frame and it transfers and this, Imagine that didn't exist. It transfers the Alembic data through an Alembic tag. This only, you can create one, but and you can put it on any object, but it has to be the object if you want it to work properly that created the Alembic. So now we have exactly the same thing, only the data is uh, coming from the Alembic and it's just moving the points around. This now, we can do the point caching. So point cache go to the first frame, store the original, and now we can calculate. When we press calculate, it's going to go through all the data and it's going to store all that motion data to the point cache. I can delete this now. I can delete this, I can delete this, I can do whatever I want. I can add a fong tag. Let's go to uh, modeling, fong tag, there you go. And this guy's still running because this little tag now, and this is an ed editable object, is just moving the points around. Now what we do, we take the point cache deformer, we put it here and we link the tag. And the final crucial step is to go here and either click use deformer or just disable this. If you disable this, then the deformer takes that data and puts it on the object. But if you go here and just uh, with it enabled, because if that is enabled, then any fields you put here won't work. And a lot of people get confused including myself, uh, because I was putting fields here and it wasn't working, because you do have to do this final step. Use the former or disable the tag. What's going to happen now is that anything you put here, linear field, is going to control which part of the model gets the data. So there you go. So oh, And it's going to get it to the percentage that the field uh, tells it to. I wonder what's going to happen if I add a, a noise. <laughs> hilarious <laughs> go. yeah, i feel like uh, seth and hashi don't forget to watch them oh look at that that's so that's so funny that's yeah. that's so funny anyhow that's how you use the point cache uh deformer any following questions please feel free to ask them yeah yeah so i'm in done meantime, with this segment yeah in the meantime i will reply to this question from anderson is it possible to move a point geometry with another one as a reference? So I'm not 100% sure if you really mean like a whole geometry or just a part of the geometry that you can define with a vertex map. Both are possible. I'm going to show you both uh, ways. Um, so let me, let me just start. So I once created, recorded a quick tip, this one here. And it's uh, actually a pretty good one, I think. Well, the topic is a good one. You can you can uh, judge if it was a good quick tip or not. Uh, let me paste that link here in the chat. Okay, so um, parent constraint quick tip. There we go. It's now in the comments. What's uh, basically happening in here? I can I can quickly go through that. Is I have this ball here, and I have the two robot arms, and robot arm one 
is supposed to pick up the ball and place it here. And then robot arm two is supposed to pick up the ball from there and put it back into its original position, right? And for that, I need um, altering parent objects. And um, one thing you can't do inside of Cinema 4D is you cannot animate objects through the hierarchies in the object manager. That's not possible. So that structure is, um, yeah, it's just fixed. It's, uh, it's a given. Um, but what you can do is you can work around that structure um, with parenting objects by using a parent constraint. In this case, um, you right click, in this case, the ball, and then we go to rigging tags, constraint tag. And here in the constraint tag, what we want is a parent constraint. So this is what we're going to use. And then this parent um, tab will appear. And now we can define um, our targets or our parents and um, then switch between them. So I'm just going to add two more. So we need three parents, Y3. So I'm going to add this first hand controller and the right hand controller. Another thing that we need, if we have a situation where we're not just passing an object on like from one hand to the other, if we're just putting it on the floor in the meantime, we need an object um, or a parent uh, that is defining the floor. What is happening when um, uh, the ball in this case is not carried by one of the robot arms. So we can just put the floor in here, right? So now we have uh, three target objects or three parent objects, and we can start by using the floor. So we set the floor as the parent object. That means that uh, the floor will have 100% parenting and uh, the other two objects will have 0% um, parenting, so to speak. And then you can hit Record Optimize. The first time you hit Record Optimize, it will set keyframes for everything that is uh, necessary here. Um, from then on, uh, it will just set keyframes for the parameters that are important. Another thing that is important here is that you work sequentially. So you go from start to finish. Otherwise, uh, you would have to to mess with values later, and that's um, not very funny. So go from start to finish. So now, uh, which one is that? That must be hand left, right? So I'm going to set hand left and record optimized. And now, in theory, what should happen is it's grabbing this tennis ball and putting it to this side, right? And here, where it's um, putting the ball down, um, we can set this back to the floor. So now the floor again is the parent and we record optimized. So now we are putting it from here to there. Brilliant. Okay. And now the other arm is coming. Let's go to here. And then we set hand right as the parent record optimized. And then it's going to bring this tennis ball back to its original position. And here we set this back to the floor, record optimized, and there we go. Now we have it. Now we have a perfect loop here, right? So this is how you would move uh, geometry based on another object. Um, but there is also uh, another thing that you can do. I'm I might be a little bit rusty in that workflow, but let's just say we have um, any object. Let's just go with a sphere. And uh, what I want to do is I want to make this editable. So I press the C key or push this little button, and then I have a polygon object. And what I'm going to do next is I'm going to, uh, in model mode, I'm going to use the pen tool here and start painting a vertex map, maybe with a little bit more radius, maybe with even more radius and less hardness, something like that. We can we can also blur this or smooth it, apply all. There we go. All right. And then 
I hope I remember this correctly. I'm going to create uh, a null and put the null somewhere here. So what I want to do is I just want to move the points that I just selected or um, yeah, weighted using the, the vertex map. And uh, I'm going to go to, where is it, character and create cluster. Let me go here, select the sphere. Character, create cluster. Oh, see, we don't even need the null. And what's happening now is, so what it created was an additional null, and it also created another vertex map. We're not going to use that, but um, also this cluster deformer. Let me see what's happening when we move the null. So it's moving the whole um, object. Um, so in here, we have to define the map. Let me see, which one is the the one that... Actually, Advice to everyone, name your tags. This is what Jonas is trying to show you. So name. there we go. Yeah, actually, actually, yes. So, and now I can just select the, the null that I created. It's always good when you, when you place it um, in a meaningful position. But yeah, um, as you can see here, you can just animate this null even. So if we uh, go to the coordinates here and let's say I want to set a keyframe for all of these, set a keyframe here again and set another keyframe there, um, I can do that. And now it's moving the way we want. And not just that, we can also rotate this. So um, can do all ah, these jiggle. weird things. Yeah, jiggle. Jiggle. but 100% controllable. I had a jiggle. Jiggle. Oh, add a jiggle. Yes. Always add, add a jiggle. A, whenever you're changing meshes, always add a jiggle, even though nobody asks for it. Just add it. So, jiggle. yeah, I, I just have the the um, assumption that EJ is using you as a channel to to promote the jiggle deformer. Um, there we go. The jiggle deformer is awesome. So let's hit play. And there we go. There's a little bit more jiggle. That's it. Yeah. You made That's your day cool. rate right now, right there. That's a day rate worth of work. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. OK, cool. So yeah, I just showed you two ways how you can uh, attach geometry to another object. One with a parent constraint was this one here uh, to really use another object as a parent or multiple objects as sequential um, parents. And then this other one here with the cluster that allows you to move just um, a portion or, or like a, a painted selection um, of points using another object. Both techniques are super useful. And for the cluster workflow, you don't have to do the create cluster. You can also just create the cluster deformer and then add, um, um, yeah, uh, populate the link fields um, accordingly. Exactly. Because this way, you could also set the, the start position for the null. All right. Let's have. have a look at more questions. I've got a couple ready here. I've got a OK, perfect. Perfect, because um, I'm not up to date with the questions. I now yeah. have to have a look. That's terrible. So um, we have a question about uh, using, so somebody watched Andy Needham's um, fracturing tutorial on, there we go. I think I found it. Let me copy this. The and, wonderful Andy's tutorial. Yes. and. Uh, I need to go here and create this, paste this in, add this, and then show it. Look at that. I did it with five clicks. Com while completing a training on LinkedIn Learning with Andy Needham, great guy. I can attest to that. He's a great guy. Absolutely. We draw crumble using a motion track video using a Vore fracture. We need, um, we use the physical render the most. The question has more. <laughs> okay. Um, 
we had to bake. I'm going to copy the rest of the question in here. <laughs> so how do I edit the rest? All right, add banner. I don't even know what I'm doing here. Okay, I edited it. Did I crash the whole thing? No, save. There we go. Saving. Let's try and save. There we go. Uh, we had to bake the texture generated um, to keep it on the Voronoi fracture. Now, the question starts with Cinema 4D Release 23. That's the title of the, of the video. But in any case, here I have a very simple, you don't need to do anything, essentially. If you apply any material using the standard UVW mapping, and let me delete these, and let me go here and delete that. So this would be your typical... Voronoi fracture of a cube. I turned off the colors here, right? So I can see the material. Um, this is a standard Cinema 4D material. You drag it here. And as long as this is a UVW material, it will stay stuck. So you will see that when this breaks, the material stays stuck. If you want the internals to be colorized differently, the Voronoi fracture has a new thing called selections. And you can um, expose the inside faces, add another material on top of the previous one, and confine it to the inside selections. And this will have no visible or very little visible seams uh, because it retains normals and all that. But uh, when it breaks apart, you get this where you can add your, I don't know, concrete texture and so forth. So um, unless this, what I showed, uh, doesn't happen, if that's the case, uh, then I think you can contact support for a bug. But this is how it works. You, you get the textures stuck to your Voronoi fracture by definition. So that's all I have to show over here. Let's go back. Um, let's go through quick a few quick questions here I can answer. Is there an easy way to record scripts like you can with Actions, Photoshop, or Mac? Well, not really in the same way, but if you're going to do any you know, Python programming and all that, what you could do, you go to the extensions and you go to the um, script log. This script log, whenever you do something, um, it should, oh, that's fantastic. It's not adding anything here. Okay. This should add these things, script log. Let me go again. It's not the console, it's a script log. Well. Wow. Bug report. Uh, it should add uh, some of these commands here. Uh, on the other hand, what you could do is it in the console. If you drag something in here, no, it's not the console. I'm going to try in the script log and drag something in there. Is this going to give you? No, this doesn't give you anything. Script manager. Create a new script. Let me drag this in here. Okay. Uh, forget the last five minutes. I don't have an answer for that right now. Yeah, because the script log is what should do that. Yeah. When you apply a command or select something or you change a, a tool, uh, you should get some logging here. Uh, yeah, and there was something um, like you wanted to show where you could drag and drop something in. Yeah, and then, then none of this seems to work now. Okay. Okay. Uh, erase, erase your memory. All right, look into this. Everyone, look into this light. Look into this light, please. <laughs> yeah, we're done with that. <clears throat> so let's uh, look at uh, the other questions here. Uh, okay, this is an interesting one because you touched upon it. In the material editor, what's the difference between RS material and RS standard material? And which one is the best one? Uh, Janos, I'll pass this on to you. Yeah, I just replied to that in the in the beginning, actually, which mm -hmm. uh, scene was it? Was it this one? So, yeah, uh, the question again is referring to the RS standard versus the material node. Um, so the material node is the old one. Um, the RS standard is the new one. Both are like um, adding all the important um, surface attributes to the material. The RS standard has a better energy conservation um, algorithm. It is a little faster. Um, it's better supported in the viewport. So there are various advantages of this one um, over this old one. So we recommend this one. 
And the subsurface, um, I think the subsurface scattering, the new random walk, only exists in the standard material? Yes. Yeah. Yes. That as well. OK. Let's have a look at the, the other questions. What else do we have? Um, what do we have? So th there's one here. It would be cool if Cinema 4D had something like a Max for Listener to spit out error messages so you can know what's happening. So that's actually possible. So you go to extensions, console, console. What's the right pronunciation, Thanasis? Uh, anything you like, Jonas. You, know, yeah. <laughs> you can just say anything you want. OK, so in this case, no real arrows, just warnings. Um, yeah that I have a lot of VRAM. That's a great warning. I always enjoy uh, having that. Um, but also here, you can see that um, yeah, compilation is succeeded and so on. And it will also show you error messages if I had any, but I don't have any here. One comment moment. I want to make is that Max script listener, as far as I remember, having touched Max, I think, 69 years ago, um, the errors there are internal errors why something is not working and in cinema 4d when we are trying to apply something uh, and it's not you know we, we if we have a cube and we try to select polygons we can't you won't get an error message it won't say anywhere oh you can't select polygons because um you you don't have you because you have an editable object you don't have an editable object and stuff like that so those kind of errors are not logged the ones that uh, Jonas is showing in the console uh, those would be errors that th there's something in the code in Python or the node system or stuff like that. You do not get workflow errors like, oh, you're moving the wrong thing or you're linking the wrong thing. Yeah. What they try true. to do, what they try to do in Cinema 4D is say that if a particular object cannot be used in a particular situation, you can't actually do it. Yeah. And in exactly. some cases, it, will, it won't crash. It will just not do it. So that's also the way. down here. Also down here, when you when you click this one, you also have a little bit of uh, status here. Yes. Um, what is this button actually doing? Oh, delete. Good. Um, I do have a I do have an answer for this one. Is there a way to create object instances for a batch of objects other than going through them one by one? All right. So. It's not as direct as you may think, but you can do it. So I'm going to create a sphere, a cube, and a cone, right? And put them here. And hopefully this is what you want me to do. You want to create an instance. Let's say these are, right, I'm going to make more of these just because I'm going to show the, the method. So we want to make instances for each and every one of these objects. And... Unless there's a command I'm not aware of, uh, the way I would do it is actually make a cloner, take off the reset coordinates so they stay where they are, generate render instances, and in that case, let me see how we can do this so we get instances of each object. I would say set this to linear, double the number of objects so we have how many objects we have here nine elements set it to 18 elements and make this editable now you have a bunch of instances which you can use and multiply without touching your original object so now i have instances 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 and so forth and that will be a way to do it if you go to my youtube channel there was a Python plugin that was given to me by a, um, a leprechaun, I think, and um, during Christmas period, which is called Instancify. And that's a different approach. That finds topologically similar objects uh, in your scene. And if all these were editable, for example, and m m creates one object and many instances of those so it's called instancify just watch all my tutorials and, and do that and subscribe and get your family to subscribe and uh yeah um if you go youtube at noseman 
you would see my YouTube channel. So if this helps, then um, I'm glad I helped. <laughs> Let's see what else. I had a couple. Do I have any tagged <laughs> instances inception? <laughs> All right. I don't have any more. Oh, do I? Um, oh, that's the Mac script. So what other questions do we have? Um, I Do you have something to show? Because I have my next thing, which is the double arm thing, which uh, I can sort of show. Yeah, show it. A solution. Show it. So the question was, I would like, all right, there we go. Let me copy this. It was basically about a delta arm uh, rig I showed in the, the mechanical rigging. Going to banners, create a banner. This is going too slow. Yeah, I, I can't get it to work. Anyway, so I'm going to ask the question here. I would ask about. Uh, I would last. I would like to ask about creating an arm similar to the delta mechanism. Right, the delta mechanism is this little guy over here, and uh, with all its drawbacks, it seems to work good enough as long as you stay within the mechanical limits of, of the system. It's just a repetition. And the question was about these double arms, that although the hierarchy itself um, has one joint here, how do the parallel ones work? So I'm going to give you a very, very quick uh, description um, of that. Uh, this, In this case, this is what this does. And the idea is the following you get your arm models and you make them children of the root so it can move with everything else you offset them slightly from each side of this line because the the concept we're trying to do is wherever this guy goes wherever oops let me um i'm moving i don't want to move on the z there we go so wherever this guy goes we just want to retain the height and the distance from that so the root, being children, will retain the distance. And I've added these constraint tags. Um, oh, I didn't even I didn't even need the constraint tags. Did I need the constraint tags? I don't think I even need the constraint tags. No, I don't. And what happens here is that because the root is going to keep these at that distance, and at the same time, down under the controller, I've added this left and right now, which have an equal offset. So this is, I think, 30 centimeters this way, and the other one is 30 centimeters the other way. And these two target tags are targeting each and every one of these nulls. So we always know that these two nulls are going to keep the same distance from our controller, the one that's controlling the joint, these two objects are always going to be child of this with a bit of an offset, and their rotation is controlled by the target tag over here. If I move this out here, you will see that whatever I do, it's always this one here is always going to look that way. I can move this. Let's turn these on. So I can move it. It will always look at the target. And just by setting this up in, let's say, a more uh, smart way, uh, you can get this parallel rig to work. And this is not rigged to anything. It's just parented to your main root, and the target tags are following these little two target tags. Now, there's one little secret to this. In the target tags, I have one extra element, the up vector. So if I clear these up vectors, what's going to happen is you're going to see these twist around. Look up here. They twist around. Because that's the, the sort of natural way the up vector works. They're trying to orient themselves. But if you have a contraption like this, you don't want them. You want them to be parallel. So I'm undoing. And what I did is I created a null that is right off this little joint. So it's uh, 87 centimeters. Just put it on the plus x. And this is, uh, this is very important. Put it on the plus x or wherever these arms are going to be, wherever the, the root is going to be, right? So it's in this direction. And then you go to your target tag and you add this. 
And what this is saying is that target the object left and right, this L and R object, just target these objects, but at the same time, retain the up vector, uh, which is the local Y, in the position this way. That's all you need to do. Just go in that way. If I pull this out here and start moving it around, you will see they're going to twist. But because I have it as part of the hierarchy, it always moves with this. So regardless of how these little bars are going to move, it always retains that parallel thing. Now, if you start rotating this, then that's a different story. But as far as a mechanism like this, where you want parallel uh, movement mostly, uh, this would work fine. And again, uh, for whoever asked the question, uh, contact me on Twitter and I can send you this uh, file so you can analyze it. Was there, uh, which, which um, uh, so in December, um, mm -hmm. you did this fantastic series about mechanical rigging. Do you know um, which, uh, in which episode you showed that? Do you remember? I think it was the last episode when I was trying to replicate everything, but I may have referenced it before. Oh my. That's a very good question. I have no idea. <laughs> I'm just uh, gonna. Oh, um, the, the timestamps. Timestamps. Are you going through timestamps? Because I think. Um, no, I'm not. I'm just. Um, mm -hmm. um, sorry, multitasking is obviously not my strength. Um, yeah, I'm. I'm uh, searching the recording. And just trying to to paste Searching the link the recording. here. There are timestamps. What are you talking about? Yeah, mechanical rigging, Cinema 4D. There it is. Week one. I'm looking at it, and let's see the the fantastic timestamps over here. Do I have the Delta rig? Let me. Uh, ring starts. Do 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 do. This is arm priorities. Double crossover assembly. No, it's not, definitely not the first one. Okay. Yeah. So... Anyway. Uh, DM me for the file and I'll send you the link. Uh, but apparently you've uh, watched them. If you go on the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel and uh, you look at the live uh, tab, you go to the live videos and uh, you find the December things that were streamed three months ago. December. Look at this. There's even one thing that is uh, super cool. If you are on the Maxon Training Team uh, site here, um, YouTube is very clever and you can use this search here, not the one on top here, this search here in the channel to um, search for the timestamps. So I think this is a good time to really um, shout out to Dr. Sassi again, because he's taking care of the timestamps. And this is one of the results, what you can do with these. Um, you just search for um, stuff um that we showed at some point and because of the timestamps um these will show up so um i found this out when i was searching for um the ice cube uh, scene that i once created and there you go it's in here so if you want to know how to create an, a photorealistic ice cube that's the as the trainer where i showed that so yeah always um just Use the search here um, because of the timestamps. It's super powerful. Well, I have, yeah. There's one more question. We're, we're, we're approaching the hour. Shall I? Hit we're it? approaching the hour. Yeah. Let's let's uh, do cool. one more question and then. Peter, is there a way to rotate the axis center of a batch of objects? There are no rotation parameters in the axis center tool, and if you type in coordinate panel, it uh, while in axis mode, it rotates the object itself. So uh, I don't know, but let's see if I understood the question. So we have some objects, uh, editable objects, preferably, right? And um, you want to rotate the axis center. This one here, is that what I assume you're trying to do? Because let me go here and look at the per object transform. 
you can see that the axis center is turning per object. I'm going to turn on my grow shading lines. So um, you select the axis uh, tool. So you only select, uh, rotate the axis. If you don't, the whole object is going to turn. But the magic is in here where you turn on the per object transform. And hopefully it's as simple as that. Turn these on and then you have this. I want to add one more thing that um, Jonas was about to show, I think. Let's assume when you select many objects, the axis by definition is the average position of all the objects. And for some reason, let's turn this off and let's make sure that the per object is off, okay? I've selected these objects. I want to rotate these objects around this sphere here, not around their center. Now, one of the things that a lot of people do, which is valid, you take the sphere, you put it up here, you take all the objects, you make them children, you take the sphere, you rotate the sphere. Good. But there is a better way. And fancy, just show your colleagues. You select all the objects, and you see these little axes here? This one, this one, this one, this one. If you go and click on this, watch what happens. It's so easy, I need to add some suspense. There you go. I don't know if you knew that, but it's it's fun. Then I can say, well, I'm going to do another thing here, and I'm going to do another one here. And that's how you rotate objects from the axis of other objects. Perfect. All right. Good. Um, I would say let's take um, care of the housekeeping now. Oh, all right. Last one. The answer is no. Okay. <laughs> is that's there? It. What was the question? <laughs> <laughs> the question was, is there a way to use a ramp to control an area light using the new material, material system, Redshift? If there is, how do you control the intensity of light? The answer is no. Yeah. All right. Cool. You can still write questions. We may refer back to them next week. Or let me just add my screen here again. Or you go to this lovely page here. And uh, I hope Kyle is still around in the background. He can paste the uh, the link. And I'm also going to bring up the QR code to get to this site. Um, just scan it. And here, the cool thing is that it's not just about all these links. But let me put it away here. Um, Another thing that you can do here is ask your questions. And um, yeah, we can then prepare maybe a few scenes for the next one. So for this one, this worked quite well. Thank you, everyone, for sending in questions um, using this way. Um, yeah, what you can see here are links to various um, interesting sites, like, for example, the Maxon events page. Here you can see all the shows that we are hosting ourselves or attending. And um, the next one that I'm going to show is the Maxon Training Team YouTube channel. As I said before, all of the links are on that side that I showed first. I'm also going to bring up the uh, QR code later again. So the Maxon Training Team uh, YouTube channel is definitely a site that you want to visit uh, because it has all the recordings and quick tips and many other things uh, on it um, that are really um, good to expand your knowledge. Then Cineversity, whenever you want to learn one of our softwares from scratch or um, also I uh, want to have a look at more advanced tutorials. Cineversity is the way to go. Then if you're interested in certification, Cinema 4D certification uh, in particular here, um, you can go to the Maxon certification page and find out a lot about uh, certification, including the certification topics. Um, these are all the topics that you need to be um, good at or sufficient at, um, in order to, to pass a certification exam. And then we have the Ask the Trainer exclusive wear store. Um, you can also reach that from the page that I showed you in the beginning. Maybe let me also show now the passcode because this one is passcode protected. And I think this month it is this one, ZBrush Print Prep, because that's the topic of our 
um, Demystifying Post-Production Series um, in, on Mondays in March. If anyone does 3D printing, by the way, check it out because it shows how you can do a model for 3D printing through ZBrush. Uh, I want to. It's super uh, exciting, yeah. James, DM me so we can take care of the shadow thing, right? DM me on cool. Twitter. Cool. All right. And then, well, usually that's the last one uh, that I show. I just had one more tab open, so I'm going to show that quick tip again just because I forgot to close it. All right, so uh, here we go. This is the side that you should enter um, by going, well, by using this QR code or using the link that is in the chat already. And as I said um, here uh, in this section, you can ask your question um, and we can then prepare a few things. And this is always, helping us. All right, with all that being said, we reached the end of this live stream. And I say thank you to everyone. Um, thank you, Noseman. Thank you, Kyle, thank you. in the background. Thank you, Kyle. Um, thank you, Dr. Zassi, for creating the timestamps. And we just saw how uh, valuable they are. Um, and thanks a lot to our wonderful audience um, have a great time and yeah, uh, watch, um, Ian's uh, live streams on Monday about, uh, print preparation, like 3d printing preparation in ZBrush. All right. Bye. -bye. Have a great time, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.